Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here once again. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Trent Smith. Dr. Smith graduated from Stanford University with a double major in biological sciences and economics. He holds a master's in civil engineering, also from Stanford, as well as both a master's and a PhD in economics from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Smith is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Prior to this, he held academic positions at Washington State University, UCLA, and the University of Bonn in Germany. Dr. Trent's research interests are broadly interdisciplinary, applying economic methods and biological perspective to better understand behavioral phenomena that would seem to violate the economist's, the economists' conventional presumptions of rationality and full information. His published research has focused in particular on dietary choice, obesity, addiction, economic insecurity, and mass marketing. Dr. Smith's inter interdisciplinary approach is reflected in intriguing titles to his articles, such as The Theory of Natural Addiction, Why the Poor Get Fat, and Economic Stressors in the Demand for Fattening Foods. Dr. Trent has presented in universities around the world, from the University of Innsbruck in Switzerland to the Paris School of Economics in France, and we are very excited to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Trent Smith. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for coming. It's, um, it's nice to be paired with Thai food now and then. Uh, so um, so uh, let me get going, because time is short. Uh, so I've been thinking about this question for more than a decade now, I guess. There's sort of this, um, if you talk to public health experts, they'll tell you that Americans eat horribly, right? That uh, our, the American diet is killing us, right? It's causing diabetes and heart disease and cancer and all these other things. And, and therefore, we should do something about it, right? Something should be done. This is what the public health people say. Um, and so, but then you know, I'm, I'm an economist, and so the economists immediately will come back and say, now, wait a minute, not so fast. Uh, you know, people, uh, people uh, in, you know, take pleasure from eating food. So there's a trade-off to be made. You know, you want to eat food that's pleasurable, um, and maybe you're trading off against long-term health outcomes to some extent. So this is sort of, like I said, this is a sort of an overarching question that I've been thinking about for, for quite a while. And I recently realized that I kind of have a, a, a series of four, I think of them now as a series of four articles that look at this question from various perspectives. So I'm going to quickly talk you through the sort of the evolution of my thinking here. Um, and we'll, we'll culminate with this the deep capture topic that we'll talk about more today. So, uh, so my first stab at this was to sort of take this, so I, I was trained first as a biologist and sort of brought that perspective into economics. Um, <clears throat> my first stab at this was to say, all right, let's, uh, let's sort of, um, you know, think about the idea that, that uh, you know, our dietary preferences to some extent come from evolutionary history. I went and read all the behavioral psychology on sort of, um, you know, which sort of environmental cues children rely upon to to develop their dietary habits when they're young. Um, and, and it was pretty striking the way they lined up. And the way they lined up was that um, uh, nearly every one of these cues, if you think about what it would, what it would mean in the context of sort of human evolutionary history, um, they would all be informative cues that, that would lead the child to developing healthy dietary habits. So an easy example is, is uh, sugar. It's the only place you find, uh, the only place you find sugar, sweet foods in nature is uh, ripe fruits, raw honey, and mother's milk. Right? So in, in, that, in that world, the pre-industrial world, uh, uh, sugar is more or less a perfect signal of nutritional quality. Right? So you can actually think of children as sort of rationally, right, optimally choosing their diets in a way that's going to lead them to, to a long and healthy life. Um, of course, you take, that, you take those preferences, these genes that tell us to like sugar um, and these, all these other cues, and you place it in the modern world, um, and you get what the anthropologists call an evolutionary mismatch. So, uh, so, so children still react to the cues, it's part of human nature, but the cues no longer lead them to this, uh, this optimal outcome. So, and of course, the food industry has figured out what the cues are. You know, if you look carefully at television advertisements, you'll, you'll see them right there in the thematic content. Um, and so there's a pretty, I think there's a pretty compelling case to be made that, uh, uh, yes, for instance, uh, consumers can, you can think of this as consumer manipulation, right? You could even think of it as... Uh, almost a form of fraud, right? Using these cues that are uh, in uh, that are, are um, in a behavioral sense being interpreted as as uh, informative by children. 
Uh, so a follow-up paper on that. Uh, so I, I came across this, this neuroscience of endogenous, endogenous opioids, which, um, which literally, uh, there's literally a, a, um, the physiological and behavioral links between uh, opioid addiction. Right? So our brains naturally produce opioids. It turns out our brains seem to produce these opioids uh, when we're exposed to food cues. So it's, this is the, the, brain, the, this, the brain mechanism that helps us develop dietary preferences is the same one that, uh, um, that gets us addicted to heroin and, and opium and so forth. Um, and, we, and so with a co-author, uh, Attila Tesnati, we, we um, wrote down a nice formal economic model of this in, in 2007. Okay, so um, coming closer to home now, uh, so in 2011, this paper appeared, uh, this was a joint with Haley, my uh, co-authors Haley Chenard and Phil Wanschneider. So this appeared in the journal Food Policy in 2011. Uh, uh, and, and here, well, to be honest, we, we started out this, this paper thinking, uh, you, know, you know, we know all, we know all this, all this we, we have all this information about how, how children develop dietary preferences and, you know, sort of, how we think that this works, and but we want to put it into a modern economic context. And what we did is we uh, we, we went and sort of uh, uh, did a lot of reading, is what we did, and, and uh, until we had sort of a coherent history of American food. Um, and, and it's an interesting story, and and uh, there were parts of it that were pretty surprising to me. But what came out of it for us was that um, we decided, you know, we don't really need psychology to tell this story, this, this story of a, of, a, of, a, of a market failure in the, market, in the food markets. Um, it's pretty clear-cut, standard, asymmetric information uh, uh, story uh, that's happened repeatedly through history and is likely happening today. So, um, um, so uh, and then the, the most recent paper, so this is uh, joint with Tasnati, appeared this year in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. Uh, and so we write down a formal, formal, um, formal economic model uh, of what we argue is, is deep capture. Um, and so it's these, it's these second two papers that I want to focus on today. So, and I'm going to do this by example. So first I'm going to give you a couple of historical examples. Uh, and then we'll talk about how they, how they fit into, how I think they fit into economic theory. Okay, so uh, first, first example. So in 1869, uh, this product, Liebig's Soluble Food for Babies, was introduced. So this is an infant formula, right? And uh, so uh, Liebig was Eustace, uh, Eustace von Liebig. He was a German, famous German chemist. Uh, he's the guy who discovered what they called the new nutrition. He figured out that, uh, that, um, that you could take any food and you could identify it, you could fully characterize its nutritional uh, content um, uh, on the basis of three nutrients, right? The nutrients were, were fat, carbohydrate, uh, and protein. And so, uh, so, and so, you know, so logically, he took this and said, all right, um, if we wanted to, to develop a substitute for breast milk, for mother's milk, all we've got to do is measure the, the protein, uh, fat, and carbohydrate in mother's milk, right? Uh, and uh, mix it into something that, that babies are willing to eat, and, and boom, mothers no longer have this burden of, of having to breastfeed their babies. Um, so 1869 was, was when this, the first sort of product was, was uh, introduced in a big way in the U.S. By 1890, uh, um, these, uh, not, just, not just this one, but others like melons, uh, melons food, here you see in the picture, um, were, were widespread in the U.S., right? So, so breastfeeding was, was very much sort of on the out. Uh, the promotional methods used are, you can actually see them, in, you can't see them in the ad, but... Um, if you look closely at the ad, you'll see that it's uh, it's you know offering to send mothers a free sample. It's uh, um, you know, a, a, and a pamphlet explaining how how, um, how they can keep their baby healthy with this food. Uh, and they actually aggressively um, marketed straight to doctors. So they would send doctors these little scientific booklets that tell them how to mix up a, the proper ratios of, of this food for for a baby of a given age and so forth. And then the doctors were telling the mothers about it. Okay, uh, so that went on and on. By 1911, there appeared an editorial in the journal Pediatrics. Uh, and the editorial was um, um, uh, up in arms about uh, what it called the sinister coincidence of, 
of um, these foods being fed to babies with uh, sort of an epidemic they were seeing of scurvy and rickets. So at the time, so by 1911, they still didn't know what a vitamin was, right? The first vitamin was discovered in 1913, I think. Uh, but they were seeing these diseases and, you know, they, they seemed to have enough. The, these, the experts were convinced they had enough evidence to conclude that it was, it was these, these artificial foods that were the reason all these babies were dying of these strange diseases. Um, so, so, so but we're at this point now where the experts seem to be pointing the finger. This food is killing people. But there's, uh, you can imagine there's, there's not necessarily a corresponding me market me mechanism to get that message out, right? There's no commercial incentive for anybody to engage in this massive, expensive marketing campaign, right? You might try to put it on government, but government moves slowly, and, and it, it basically didn't happen. Uh, so it wasn't until the 1930s, so this was, you know, a period of 60 years um, before this problem was solved. So... Uh, at this point, um, the chemists had figured out what vitamins were. They had, the chemists had, had, um, had developed the, the ability to quantify vitamins in food. Um, at this point, it just became uh, completely obvious that, that this was the problem, right? There, the, there was vitamins were completely absent in a lot of these processed foods. And, was, and, and that was the reason for these, uh, these nutrition diseases, diseases of malnutrition they were seeing. And, 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 and the problem was actually solved pretty quickly at that point. It's pretty easy to fortify food once you know vitamins are cheap. It's pretty, pretty easy to add them back in. Okay, so, uh, so in this, this um, food policy paper, we go through several examples of this. You actually see this again and again throughout food history. Uh, a, 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 um, a new a novel food processing technology is developed. A new product is, is, uh, uh, is released. Um, it takes, uh, it, it's, it's widely adopted, it's promoted as being healthier than traditional foods. Decades pass before the nutrition scientists figure out it's killing people. And then typically 10 to 20 years pass before uh, uh, legislation or, or technology comes along to solve the problem. Okay, so one more historical example here. Uh, so this is a campaign for new food standards in the 1930s. Uh, so let's see, so in 1933, um, there was, so remember, this is a point at which um, people now knew what vitamins were. They, they, um, and they saw that, uh, you know, canned foods had less of them than fresh foods, right? So uh, just because of the, like, the canning process and the heat destroys vitamins and so forth. Um, and so people were all up in arms, you know, we can't trust this canned food. We can't tell how, you know, what's happened to it before it's gone in the can. Um, we'd like, you know, we'd like a mechanism that would allow us to, to be able to tell, right, in the grocery store which of these canned foods is better than the others. The U.S. Department of Agriculture at the time was, was developing this, this a, a grading system, right? So they were going to, they were, they were sort of choosing the most commonly consumed foods and, 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 uh, and figuring out what could be tweaked in the processing to make them higher quality in the can, right? So how, how, hot, hot, you, you know, how hot they get during processing and how the quality of the fruit going in, right? There are ways you could do this. Um, they did it, right? So they had this scheme where they were going to say, if you, want, if you want to sell grade A pears, this is what you have to do, and, and, and so forth. Um, so the political debate here was interesting. There have been entire books written on this episode. It's, it's, it's a fascinating period. But the, uh, so on one side of this political debate were, were a group of, uh, of small regional canners and consumer groups, an incredibly long list of consumer groups. I think there were more consumer groups back then than there are today. Um, but they were in favor. They said, "Yes, we want this. We want we right. We want to we want to uh, be able to, to 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 see quality in the grocery store on the grocery store shelf." Uh, on the other side of the political debate, a uh, coalition of large national brand canners um, and national magazines. Right. So why were national magazines here? Uh, so, they, so the, the canners were, of course, the, the biggest, biggest single advertiser, I think, for, for these national magazines at the time. <clears throat> and so, yeah, the, the, like the representative of the publishers literally showed up in the U.S. Congress and testified that he was here speaking on behalf of the American housewife. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, this, and these standards would be a bad thing for the American housewife. Uh, and so this raged on for five years or so, and it, it, the... the, the um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that eventually got passed was passed without the tiered grading system. Okay, so now I have um, a, a lovely quote. I think this captures a lot about, uh, about what I want to talk about today. Um, 
So this is a quote from Arthur Callett, who was there watching this debate. So he was a big consumer advocate of the time. He was one of the founders of Consumer Union, Consumers Union and one of the founding editors of Consumer Reports magazine. So um, I'm going to read this to you. So, uh, so he says, the product of the large nationally advertising canners is for the most part of mediocre quality. And this must be so since the scale of their output does not permit them to select from the best. The companies have naturally resisted efforts to have all cans carry a grade mark indicating the quality of the contents. Imagine the effect on, can, uh, on Del Monte advertising and prices, for example, of B and C grade marks on Del Monte cans. Okay. So uh, that, I think that makes sense, right? He, so he was there watching this, but you know, just as an economist, that sounds, that sounds like it's right. So these big, uh, um, these big mass producers are producing a lower quality product almost because they have to at, at that scale. Um, and you've got these, the, uh, these smaller producers that are, um, uh, that want to compete, and in fact, they have a quality advantage, but they can't convey that message easily to the consumer, right? So this, this, uh, this grading system would have opened up these new markets, right? Where you'd have uh, these markets for higher quality goods uh, um, that these small producers could sell to. So this is, so I wanna, I wanna remark that this is, this is very much, this is a classic asymmetric information problem in economics, right? That, that uh, when, when quality is undeservable, you, you get what we call the lemons equilibrium, right? Does everybody, does everybody, has everybody heard these terms? Do I need to back up? So, <laughs> so, so, so uh, the lemons equilibrium, the term comes from uh, George, George Akerlof's famous 1970 pa 70 paper. Um, and he was talking about used car, used car markets. And when you sell a used car under the market, it might be a lemon or it might be a good car. Um, and the seller knows which it is. Uh, and then the buyer, you know, doesn't know, right? So, you, you can, uh, and you know, the sellers of lemons are still going to claim their car is a good car. And so, uh, uh, buyers knowing this are less likely to pay, right, right, the value of a good car uh, on the on the used car market. And you, and so, um, you know, the sellers of good cars, no, seeing this, say, uh, if I can't get the value, I'm just not going to sell my car. I'm just going to keep my car. And you can get a complete market collapse in which nothing, nothing but lemons are for sale, right? Nothing but low quality product is for sale. Um, so that's what this looks like to me, right? That, that uh, you've got this uh, market collapse, right? So it's, it's possible for, there, there are these higher quality markets, uh, higher quality products that could be on the market or would be on the market if, if, um, if there wasn't this information based market failure. Um, um, but they're not, okay. Um, and well, and of course, what's interesting here is that the um, that this didn't just come about naturally, right? So that these these big canners are actually pushing this, right? The, the lemons equilibrium is profitable for them, right? So they're putting all this money into into fighting against these these rules that might might solve the problem of the market failure. Okay, so in the in our, uh, our this two, in our 2011 paper, we um, we said, all right, this seems like a case of, of regulatory capture, uh, you know, in which you know industry is capturing its regulator and right and, and uh, pushing for pushing for rules that uh, increase its profits, um, uh, right? So this is a, a standard theory in economics, right? There's a big body of literature on this since since Stigler uh, published the first paper in 1971. And with it, and with it, a new sort of a whole um, um, body of um, theory of regulation has has been developed with it, right? So, so we now have very clear sort of, uh, or we think we have a pretty clear understanding of, of what it what it takes to have have um, you know avoid conflicts of interest in in, uh, in regulation, right? How to make our regulators independent of industry. Um, but then, if you look more closely at what was happening here, it's not quite regulatory capture, right? So it's um, so these. These, you know, the national magazines, for example, uh, weren't just lobbying a regulator. They were lobbying Congress, which isn't quite what regulatory capture was supposed to be about. Um, but they were also lobbying the public directly, right? So there were a couple of, there were, so there were actually a couple of national magazines that uh, editorialized in favor of the grading standards. So uh, um, was it Ladies Home Journal and Good Housekeeping, I think. And they, they, they said, um, you know, they wrote editorials in their magazine saying, yeah, these new standards would be great for the, for the, for the American housewife. And, and, uh, uh, but then they were forced into uh, embarrassing reversals is the term the, the historians use. So then in the very next issue, they had to reverse themselves and say, uh, right, they'd obviously been pushed by their, by their advertisers, right, to, 
to change their mind. So, but but the, the whole idea that that um, they were using their magazines, right? The, 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 or the food industry was the can the big canners were indirectly using the magazines to affect public uh, opinion about this. Um, really sounds a lot more like deep capture, I think, than the the standard regulatory capture story. Okay, so uh, now I want to talk you through our economic theory. So there's, of course, a formal mathematical theory in the paper, um, but, I, but I can tell the story intuitively. So what we do is we, we write down a standard, uh, standard economic search theory model, right? So this is, um, these models assume that consumers uh, care about quality, but they can't observe it perfectly. And so, um, and, and, and observing quality is costly. Right? So they're often written down as sequential search models where consumers just sample one product at a time, right? observe the quality, and then decide whether to keep that product or keep, keep searching. Right? And each time they have to pay a cost. And so um, at some point, it just, um, you know, it sort of if, if, you've, if, if you've sampled, if you've gotten something good enough, at some point it's better just to stop right? than to keep paying that cost. So, uh, so that's very much a standard standard economic model. We pick a classic one, uh, um, Weitzman's 1979 uh, model, and and put it into our theory of deep capture. Uh, on the on sort of on the seller side, we say um, we're thinking of food, but this we think this structure is more general than that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, there's two kinds of products: high quality products and low quality products. The high quality products um, can be approved can be produced at small scale, right? So this means, this really means sort of uh, uh, traditionally produced foods, right? So not, not industrial produced foods. Uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, sort of producing a traditional food, there's not a lot of advantage to scaling it up. That's, that's the logic here. So, um, so the high quality product is produced on a small scale, so we assume it's a competitive market, um, which in economics means zero profit. Uh, the low quality products, on the other hand, uh, are produced best, it's, they, they enjoy co economies of scale, so they're uh, most efficiently produced at large scale. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, so, so that's the supplier side, the seller side, on the buyer side we've got these consumers that care about quality but can't observe it perfectly. Um, and uh, so in our model we literally have, so we literally have, you know, parameters in the model which, which are things like the cost to the consumer of of selecting another, right? The consumer's beliefs about, um, you know, the, uh, the likelihood that this is going to be of, of such and such quality, uh, of a given type is going to be of such and such quality, uh, and so forth. Um, and so, and but what happens in the equilibrium in our model is that the market share of low quality products, which is what our big low quality producer cares about, uh, depends on the parameters of the consumer's search problem. So. Uh, so we're actually going to make that the thing that the that the producer tries to change, right? That's that's how he can increase his profits, uh, is to to take steps to alter these these costs that the consumers face to obtaining information. Okay. Um, so the, the thought experiment, anyway, is what would a producer do if they could uh, uh, affect the consumer search problem? The most interesting. So there are lots of answers because we have you know several parameters in our model. The most interesting one, I think, is, is there's, there's unambiguous incentive to obfuscate, right? to, to increase the cost of, of search for consumers, of, of, of uh, taking another draw. Uh, and that's true even if, you, even if you think of there just as being one cost that's the same for both high and low quality. Right? Even if they had to increase their own sampling costs, they, they would do it. Okay. So uh, let's see. So in the paper, so in the in our deep capture paper, um, we don't talk about history. We talk about today, and the and the the empirical application that we have in mind uh, is the sort of the public debate over the causes of, of the obesity epidemic. Uh, and if you uh, if you uh, develop a trained eye, it's pretty easy to find uh, to figure out what the industry talking points are when this issue comes up. Um, and so here, they, so uh, I don't know. There are more or less three of them. Uh, I, here they are. So, so counting calories. This is uh, um, basically an, uh, um, maybe not a direct argument that quality doesn't matter, but it's an indirect argument, right? Uh, that um, the quality of the food you doesn't quality of the food you doesn't eat it doesn't, doesn't matter what you eat. Um, it just matters how much. It just matters how many calories you eat. Right? Sounds plausible. 
Um, exercise more, so there's a lot of uh, finger pointing that, oh, the reason people have gotten, uh, gained so much weight is that they don't exercise as much as they used to. Um, and then the third message is, is a, sort of a consumer freedom message, so let, let consumers choose. <coughs> hey, why, should we, why should government be choosing what we, what we eat? We should be able to choose for ourselves. Okay. Um, yeah, so we argue in the paper that these, are, these three are all very much conventional wisdom in sort of the American public today. Um, uh, they're also fairly obviously intended to defect, uh, deflect blame from the, from the food industry for the, for the obesity epidemic. Um, they're also all three, uh, um, uh, so I'll say unsupported by science, but, it, but it's, you can make a case that they're actually contradicted uh, by, by the best evidence. Um, so, so we don't say that, so we, we don't actually make the claim in the paper that, that the food industry is to blame for the obesity epidemic, um, but we say there's an argument to be made, right? um, that it could be food quality and it could be the industry pushing it. Um, and that's, um, so uh, let's see, so I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to go through these one by one, um, uh, although the, the evidence is very interesting, especially on the calories question. So, so it turns out many, um, many foods actually have direct effects on appetite. So, so you know, you can go intending to eat a, fix, a given amount of calories, but if you choose a food that's going to stimulate your appetite, you wind up eating more. Um, like I said, it's really interesting stuff. Um, but I want to focus now on point three, right? So the let consumers choose bit. Because this is, um, I think this is a point that is that uh, John Hansen has written about more generally as being pretty key to the idea of deep capture. Uh, and it's also, um, it's also probably the point we take on most directly with the, with the model we've written down here. Okay. Uh, so, you know, so our answer to this, you know, why can't we just let consumers choose is pretty, uh, it's pretty direct in our model, right? It's uh, the consumers are choosing rationally in the face of information constraints. They just, uh, but they're not the ones choosing the parameter values, right? There, it's, it's uh, in many ways, it's the food industry, right? It's the canners lobbying against these rules that would uh, make quality observable, uh, right, historically. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, today, it's more about um, pushing these talking points on people so that they, they don't think quality matters. Uh, um, consumers aren't choosing those parameters, so uh, um, it's not really the market speaking, right? It could really be the industry speaking when you, when you observe this outcome where everybody's eating the, uh, the low-quality diet. Uh, you could also take a um, sort of the social psychology view, and, right? So uh, people are, are manipulatable. Uh, because they have you know, psychological weakness, or, or, or they're you know just uh, uh, people are just susceptible to you know uh, um, cues in the environment and so forth. That the, the things I wrote about earlier, right? That that um, could get them to choose a given food. Um, so uh, and so that's 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 another answer, right? That's probably just as powerful. That that. Uh, um, that in that case, choice, uh, choice or, the, or the equilibrium outcome is driven by marketing strategies. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but again, the conventional wisdom is that people are, are am I running short on time? The, uh, um, is that there's a lot of confusion out there, right? A lot of people believe this calories is all that matters and, and maybe quality doesn't. Okay, but that, that, um, that confusion is actually something that our market predicts, right? That's something that benefits the industry. Okay, so, uh, so I would say there are broadly sort of two ways to, to say, to, um, to explain why deep capture is even possible, right? This is a big question out there. Is it even possible that industry can affect the public mind, right, as the, as the old PR guys used to call it? Um, and so uh, uh, one answer is the social psychology view uh, that, um, Psychology is real. Uh, industry's figured out, in many cases, uh, um, how to manipulate it. Um, context matters in consumer decisions. Industry chooses the context, um, and they choose the context that's most profitable. Okay. Um, so, in our so in our paper, um, we leave out the psychology and say, you know, all it takes is informational frictions, right? So this is a, it's kind of a separate argument. Um, but it's really, if either one of these things is true, uh, you can get deep capture, right? 
you can get uh, in, uh, sort of industry choosing the, the equilibrium we come to. So a bit of economic jargon for you. This is what we call a multiple equilibrium problem or mul multiple equilibria, if you like, uh, in economics. And that's the, uh, so normally in economics, you've got supply and demand, right? Where supply and demand come together, you have, you have equilibrium, right? That's, that's where the market leads us to. Uh, multiple equilibrium just means that there's, uh, that that's, there's not just one way that could happen, right? So, and, and uh, the information story is that if you sort of, if you start with consumers, you know, either consuming uh, a particular thing or, you know, having particular beliefs about quality or something like that, you come to one equilibrium outcome. But if you start from a different place where people are either, you know, start out consuming some, a particular thing, a particular batch of goods, um, basket of goods, or they, you know, have, you know, different beliefs that have them, uh, consuming this goods, you come to a different uh, equilibrium outcome, right? So um, this is very generally true. Whenever you have frictions uh, in the market, uh, and in particular informational frictions, right, things like search costs, you're generating an equilibrium selection problem, right, multiple equilibria situation. Uh, now, of course, industry looks at this and says, not all of these, e in these equilibria that are possible are equally profitable. What can we do to move ourselves to the one that's more profitable? And there's no guarantee, especially in the case of food, that that's going to be the best one for consumers. Right. Okay, so I want to emphasize that there's, um, there's honestly not a lot new in what, uh, what uh, Attila and I have written down here in this, uh, this economic theory of deep capture. Um, we're very much using off-the-shelf standard economic concepts and models. Um, um, and so if you want, so if, here's a list of jargon terms for you if you want to make this argument yourself, right? So um, we assume consumer rationality, but not perfect information um, um, that we're really talking about lemons equilibrium uh, problem that's, that's being induced by industry. Um, you know, consumer search, economies of scale, uh, multiple equilibria, these are all standard concepts. Uh, let's see, so, yeah, so I've listed re, um, uh, a couple of related legal concepts here. So, uh, you know, the, the economic theory of asymmetric information is really just an economic theory of fraud, right? And sometimes it's called that uh, very explicitly in the literature. Um, there's also obviously antitrust issues that um, it really takes a powerful, right, a, a powerful firm to do this kind of thing in a big way. Um, and last, I should apologize to the food industry for picking on them. I could have chosen just about, uh, well, I could have chosen uh, many other industries. I used to teach a class on financial derivatives uh, during the financial crisis, actually. And uh, uh, my students insisted that I, that I educate myself about, about what happened there. And, and I, I could have easily chosen examples from that to tell this, tell this same story. Okay, so I'm going to, um, to uh, end with this quote. Uh, I, this, I love this quote from Bernays. So Edward Bernays was, uh, they call him the father of public relations. This is from his book, Propaganda, in 1928. Uh, um, so we included this in our, we actually included this quote in our paper. Um, uh, and it almost looks like we stole the idea from him. We actually didn't come across the quote until we'd already written the paper. But we found it in time to, to include it. But he's, so Bernays is, is uh, um, um, so he's a proponent of propaganda, right? He wants everybody to use this and to recognize that you really can't live without it. There's just, you know, the world is too complicated. You, you, you need propaganda to, to function as a society. But if you read what he writes there, he's literally talking about a consumer search problem, right? That information is costly. It's, it's hard to get. Therefore, we have no choice but to submit to, to propaganda, right? Okay, thanks. So my question is, do you either in the paper or personally advocate any kinds of policies to correct some of the things you looked at here? Um, yeah, so this is a very underdeveloped area, right? So there's, yeah, uh, so the, um, like I said, for, reg for the case of regulatory capture, there's a big body of, of academic research out there. Um, that's not so true for deep capture. It's just not, it hasn't been studied. It's, it's kind of shocking how little it's been studied by academics, uh, given how widespread the problem has to be. Um, you know, uh, uh, 
I suppose if I had one wish, it might be related to antitrust, right? That, 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 that might be the first, uh, first place to push if you wanted to try to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, so in your opinion, do you think um, internet and the availability of information on basically any product like that, is that making the consumer search easier by providing that information or harder to overwhelm them? Um, yeah, does the internet, well, yeah, does the internet help with this problem or hurt? You, yeah, you would think it would hurt, right? It may, uh, I mean, you would think it would help, right? It makes, it seems to make information less costly. There, um, so that, yeah, that could be true. So, um, uh, so the internet is very good at um, helping with price competition, for example, right, in some cases, uh, um, which you can think of, of as one kind of consumer search, right? Um, <clears throat> But there are a lot of cases where, uh, where it's just not enough. Uh, so uh, an example is, um, an example might be uh, organic food labels, right? So before we had this standardized organic food label in 1990, I think, um, the word organic was meaningless, right? And if you wanted to buy organic food, you could, but there were all these competing claims out there about, oh, my food's organic, my food's natural, my food's pesticide-free. Um, and they, they, at some point, they became meaningless because even the low quality people who weren't really organic in any sense were still making claims that sounded similar, right? You really needed this uh, sort of uh, credible third party in some sense to say, all right, if you want to make that claim, this is how it's defined. Um, and, and, and as a result, we, have, we now have this, you know, multi-billion dollar global industry, uh, organic food industry, right? Um, and so the internet isn't going to solve that kind of problem, right? So that historical pattern which you showed is very interesting where first they introduce new food and decades later they find out there's something wrong. Uh, I don't know if you looked at it, but uh, would that be applicable today to genetically modified food or is that something? Uh, well, that's a good question. So the historical pattern has always been new technology introduced, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years passes and the, and the nutrition scientists say, oops, that's killing people. <laughs> and then there's this political fight. Uh, so, you, so you could argue that the default assumption should be that that might well be true of new technologies like genetically modified foods. Um, the, um, uh, but that's all I can really say about that, right? I don't know, there, I don't know that there is good evidence yet that, that GMOs hurt people. Well, that's, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure there are plenty of examples where there's some little technological tweak that, that nobody has, you know, it pointed the finger at for, for public health problems yet. So it's, yeah, it's hard to answer that definitiv definitively. Uh, but, but the, I mean, you would, because of, because of what we know about human biology, that we're, we kind of evolved to eat a particular diet, or, or within, you know, with, within a certain range a particular diet, um, you would expect that industrial processing, in general, isn't going to stumble upon uh, nutritional quality that's higher than, than unprocessed foods. It makes a lot of sense from an economist perspective and the UV obesity issue as a market failure. But if we've reached a limit in equilibrium, what would be your policy suggestions to reset the equilibrium and change the incentives? Well, the, the, uh, the, the standard economic answer to that question is if you have a lemon's equilibrium, a market failure, right? Lemon's equilibrium, uh, you need, so one way to solve it is to come up with a credible third party quality verification system, right? Like the organic standard. So um, uh, if it's true, like we suggest in the paper, that you know, uh, there are certain aspects of processed foods that um, stimulate appetite, um, and we could identify that, if we could quantify that, right? It's in principle, at least, it's, it's, uh, we could use that standard mechanism, right? We could put a label on, on foods. This one's going to make you eat more. <laughs> And that would, right, that would go a long way, I think, to solving that problem. Can you just speak briefly to the two assumptions about uh, Fresh, um, higher quality and zero profit and lesser quality and more profit? And I would imagine that there's, with more specialization, there's 
a much more margin, better margin. Why is that assumption the reverse? Yeah, so, well. In, in just if you look at the markets today, especially probably. Yeah, yeah, well, so in, um, yeah, so this is a very stylized model, right? That, that uh, uh, so today we've got, um, you know, you can buy industrial food or you can buy from specialized, uh, high cost, uh, but but probably higher nutritional quality foods, uh, and so um, so we just very simply model that as a competitive market. These are small companies, um, uh, so an economist would say it's zero profit, but that doesn't literally mean zero profit, right? This is a standard disclaimer I need to add. Um, so uh, so yeah, you, you can see people making accounting profit or people who are particularly clever at, at doing that, um, but in the big scheme of things, the you know. The, the big money is where the big power is, right? Where the big big market power and low manufacturing costs, right? That's that's a lot of what manufacturing the, the big large scale manufacturing technologies are about. It's minimizing manufacturing costs. So this is, I mean, you could, this is you could argue that the the local food movement today is a reaction to this market breakdown, right? People, there are a lot of people who no longer trust industrial food. They're recognizing that's a lemon's equilibrium, and so they're. They're looking for someone they can trust, right? That they, they they have to pay a lot more, and they have to invest time in, in, in a relationship and that kind of thing. Some form of like import substitution, some form of substituting a product for a different product. Yeah. 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 Why do you think this problem is specifically uh, typical to the U.S.? Because in other parts of the world, maybe obesity exists, but it's not that kind of a big issue. And here, you can't avoid it because when you go traveling around, all you have is either pizza, Starbucks, or, or McDonald's. You don't have any other choice. It's not like you don't have information. You know that it's bad for you, but you're hungry. So you have to eat something. and it's. Even in, even in this lecture. So you're, so you're saying. <laughs> so, uh, so you're saying you think this is a, a an American problem, or, or more an American problem than. But, from an outsider's perspective, but it's more typical to the U.S. Yeah, the problem of obesity is. Yeah. Much bigger I don't know. So the 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 skull. Well, uh, I don't know. So this this uh, this se does seem to be a problem that started in the U.S. So a lot of these innovations were were first, uh, you know, uh, they were local. So they started here and were were right. And the, the, it was this big national market that that started that became uh, available in 1900 that that made it possible in the first place, uh, to, right, to market to this whole, the whole country. It created this huge market that. Um, that you know gave incentive to produce new technologies that facilitated mass distribution and so forth. So that could be part of it that America has has had this big head start. Um, if you read the so, um, the scholars who study public relations and, and propaganda from a critical perspective, um, they'll often say that they they consider America to be the most propagandized country in the world. And that I mean, so it could that could be a bit of it too, right? That there's a more more well-honed propaganda machine here, if you like. <laughs> yeah. I actually had a very, very similar question. Uh, it's going to be different. So I was wondering about the scope of your research because some of the assumptions behind why this new structure is impossible are related to the interest. <coughs> so you have a, you, know, you you have very powerful actors, almost monopolistic, highly concentrated like food industry, and that didn't apply in some other countries. So I'm thinking some European countries where. You have, you know, much more smaller producers like I don't know France and Denmark. Uh, so, do you think this is was possible in the U.S. only, or is it happening elsewhere too, or not to the same extent? And if not, then now we have. Uh, uh, how come if I don't know Denmark develops a good uh, food uh, um, labeling practice that doesn't spread to to other countries where? The U.S. industry might not be able to capture, I don't know, the Danish, Danish regulators, and consumers would start to rely on on Danish uh, food labeling standards. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's probably beyond my expertise. 
Yeah, I mean, so obviously there, there are so many differences across countries, right? It's always hard to nail down why it is that right, the Danish or the French have better food in, in particular, right? I mean, so um, food culture there is almost certainly stronger, right? So America is this amalgam of, of immigrant Im immigrants and and uh, and maybe has less uh, less uh, uh, less strength to the uh, coherence to the food culture, but there are also attitudes about regulation and so forth that. Um, or, or even, or maybe, or even in some cases, you see um, political power of small farmers is is much bigger in some countries than in others. Perhaps hmm? in the whole region, I think uh, on organic products, Austrian labels are you know definitely followed. So even in my country, I don't care what my regulator says, but you know if it's Austrian organic label, then then it's then it's organic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, country of origin, origin is a big deal these days everywhere. That's a, that's a big issue in New Zealand, too. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you for coming. Um, I thought it was really interesting, you know, your third step of once the science comes out that this food is poisonous and killing people, then we get into the political debate of how to fix it. But then when you got to the three myths that we all now buy into, you know, the count calories, exercise more, I could think of three legislative pushes that fit with each one of those. So you see the deep capture even spreading to the people who would count themselves as advocates to fix this problem. So count calories, you have the menu labeling legislation, exercise more, the Let's Move campaign, which granted is in the law, but you still see um, it's a little disturbing to think about maybe that even what we would consider public health organizations or public health advocates are maybe perpetuating these myths further. And I wonder, um, I guess, have you thought about or talked to people about, you know, given the limited resources that we have, can we coalesce around what we know are actual truths as opposed to myths that maybe have been spread? Trying to trying to get the advocates out of deep capture yeah. seems like a um, pretty pressing problem. Yeah, that's a tough question. So in the paper, we actually, um, one example we talk about is the 2005 uh, dietary guidelines in, in the US. Which was, um, which, 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 which was kind of, it was kind of outrageous that, like, that, that it literally took these three messages and wrote them right into the, right? So the new food pyramid that year had a, had a, a little stick figure stair stepping up the pyramid, right? It's supposed to be dietary guidelines, but there's this physical activity message. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you go to the website, uh, it's all about counting, like, it shows school kids how to count their calories. Uh, and it's uh, and uh, oh oh and then the, the name of the website was my pyramid right so consumer choice is written written right into it and uh, you know my daughter was in school in Idaho at the time and she you know in sixth grade or something and this literally what they spent like two weeks on this in their nutrition curriculum like the kids all went on to mypyramid.gov and and you know counted their calories and at the time I wasn't aware of of <laughs> of, of how slanted these messages were she was getting at school but but um, yeah, this is where the this is where the term deep and deep capture, I think, uh, comes into play. How do you stop that? Yeah. <laughs>